Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 226, recorded Monday, November 23rd, 2015. S. Shankar of AMI. Triangulation is brought to you by Epson and Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all in one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash EcoTank to find out more. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week. Get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money for those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash triangulation to apply for a loan now. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting minds in technology. And uh, we get it's, uh, it's like a thrill for me because I get to spend a whole hour with such great people, such interesting people. And I'm thrilled to welcome S. Shankar to uh, our show today. He is the founder and uh, CEO of a company you probably have heard of if, you, if you've ever used a PC, American Megatrends Incorporated, or AMI. Mr. Shankar, thanks so much for joining us on Triangulation. It's my pleasure. The first question I asked, of course, is, do you still make BIOSes? And you do. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we want to talk about is uh, this uh, new Android for Windows, the Duos uh, product. But let's let's start. Let's go back, if you don't mind, in 1985. And when you started AMI. Uh, 1985, I came over from India to the United States. And right away started the company because it was not easy to get a job. If you can't get a job, make one of your own. Exactly. So founded the company. I had a friend in this country who encouraged me to do that. So he was a partner, and the two of us started a design consulting company. Design Our, of uh, Windows software or? Uh, no, actually, uh, what we did was to offer design consulting services to design motherboards. Ah, for the PC hardware industry. design. Yeah, exactly. Ah. Because we were, I was very excited about the PC industry. I thought it had a great future. Uh, the company that I worked for in India was designing PCs. So I had a lot of background and experience in designing PC motherboards and developing software for it. So I saw an opportunity in this country to offer design services for designing and developing PC-compatible motherboards. You know, at that time, in 1985, PCAT was the rage. Yes. It used 80286 microprocessor. Right. So we foresaw at that time that performance was going to be key. So we decided to do a 80386-based motherboard. Were these the first 386-based motherboards? Uh, it turned out it was, mm. because what we did, we had designed 286, so we saw the 386 specifications and decided that we could design a motherboard, went to Vegas and offered our design services to PC companies and told them that we could develop an 80386-based motherboard and they could be the first in the world with a 386-based product. Wow. And at the show, I ran into Michael Dell, <laughs> who was running, running PCs Limited. Wow. He was, yeah, he was doing business as PCs Limited. Was he still in college, or had he, he had graduated? He, he had not graduated. He, he was had still dropped a college out. kid. Dropped out. No, he had dropped yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. okay. 
He said he was making too much money at PCs. <laughs> Building PCs in his dorm room. Uh, yeah, well, he had gone beyond that when I met him. Yeah. He was actually running a company. We had a little booth at the show. He stopped by and I wanted to know what we were doing. And we said we offer design services and he got interested. Started talking to me and uh, I suggested that he should look at uh, doing a Swan motherboard because what he was doing at that time, he was buying motherboards. Sure. He was assembling them and shipping them. And um, he was selling them by being the lowest cost provider in the PC industry. He sold mainly by low-balling pricing at that time. Yeah, he wasn't a performance leader. He was a price leader. Uh, he was conscious of performance, but he was a price leader for sure. Yeah, yeah. I suggested to him that instead of buying motherboards, he could develop his own motherboard and we could design a motherboard for him. And guess what? He got really interested. So at the end of the day, he invited me and my partner to dinner. Uh, we talked uh, for some time and we said that if he was interested, we could do a 80386 motherboard. So he said that he would like to get in touch with us after the show. After the show at that time, my partner lived in New Jersey, so I went back to New Jersey. And a few days later, in walked Michael Dell into that office, showing that he was really serious about this project that he talked to us about at, at uh, Comtex in Vegas. Uh, he said that he was very interested in what he had ta talked about. He said that, uh, can you come over to Austin? Because what I don't want to do is to have you do the design. Here in New Jersey, I would like to keep an eye on you guys. <laughs> and uh, really, that was a godsend because while we had said that we had a design consulting company, I did not really have any equipment to do the design. Oh. So uh, the company had been started without any money because I had come over from India. And at the time, India would not allow anybody to take out any currency out of that country. It is what is called Foreign Exchange Limited. So with Michael Dell offering to host me in Austin, the, the decision was made. I flew over to Austin. Believe it or not, Michael Dell was at, at the Austin airport to receive me <laughs> <laughs> and take me to an apartment he had rented for me. Wow. He, he was serious his, about this. But getting a 386 was, was a big serious. deal, I guess. Yeah, it, it certainly was. He was there, um, the apartment had been rented, so uh, there I was in the apartment, so what I did, I had a couple of friends that I knew who would be interested in the project. I rounded them up. We were all uh, based in that uh, little apartment. We started designing 386 motherboard, and this happened to be located just opposite PCs Limited. You could just walk across the road to PCs Limited at that time. You so were, that is how we got our start by doing a PC project for Michael Dell. The big, the big uh, contract. That's pretty exciting. That's really neat. He, yes, and um, we started developing the motherboard. We needed a BIOS for it. We started developing a BIOS for this motherboard. And at that time, Phoenix was the only game in town. That's so right. It turned out a bit so expensive. We convinced Michael that we could do a 386 BIOS for his motherboard, which we did. Let me ask about that a little bit. So the IBM released the IBM PC in 1981. And I don't know if it was that they thought this isn't going to be a big deal. I'm not sure why. But for some reason, they didn't really hold on too tight to the design. They kind of, they basically opened the door for compatibles something IBM as a mainframe company had fought for years in court all the way to the Supreme Court. So this made it possible for people like you uh, to come along and make compatible PCs. Michael Dell had come along and make compatible PCs, Eagles. And I had an Eagle because I couldn't afford a PC. So I had the, uh, the, the Eagle 286, which was uh, hideously unreliable. They probably were using a Phoenix BIOS at the time. Um, but one of the stories people tell is the one thing IBM did copyright was the BIOS, the software, uh, the basic input-output system that, that booted the PC, the operating system that started the operating system. 
and that the only way Phoenix could create one was to reverse engineer it to clean, in a clean room. Is that what you had to do too? Yeah, that's exactly what we had to do. So, you know, IBM, I think, was concerned about antitrust regulations. Ah. And what I, heard, what I heard is that the internal projections for the PC was about 50,000 to 250,000 PCs. Not worth risking they, antitrust. Exactly. So they decided to go out and buy the operating system and all the compilers and everything that went with it. I guess they had a couple of patents on the PC. And in addition, they also had copyrighted the BIOS. So they assumed that they had enough to protect themselves. And that was a big mistake. A mistake so for IBM, the, maybe, but a great thing for the rest of the world because it made it possible for an entire ecosystem to develop. And you have Microsoft that came out of that. You had Dell that came out of that. Compaq came out of that. I mean, it was a, it was a, a very 1985 was a very vibrant time. Uh, uh, the, it's interesting because the AT was also a, an IBM design. Did they do the same thing with the AT? Did they kind of, you know, patent a couple of pieces but not the whole thing? Yeah, that's exactly right. They had a couple of patents which applied to the AT, and in fact. Um, because we were licensing and manufacturing motherboards at that time, we had to get a license. Oh, so you did license IBM. it. Okay. We did. Yeah. But the we BIOS is a different patents. matter. The BIOS was a copyright. Yeah. So what we had to do was to clean room it. So we had a different team to develop the specs for it. Then using the specs, we had to develop the BIOS. So the initial BIOS was not um, what you would call very similar to what IBM had to offer. Functionally, it was very similar. You have to, fact, don't you have to duplicate all the calls, all the interrupts and everything to make sure that the software will work? Exactly, because yeah. uh, what IBM did, uh, IBM actually published the source code for the BIOS. Oh, but you can't so look at that. Call, uh, <laughs> we had a separate team look at it and then document it. Oh, they created okay. the spec document for the PC. Right. Then another group took the specs and all the functional calls in it. Then they started uh, coding the BIOS for it. Us. Then it was easy to test it because all you had to do is to take the BIOS, plug it into a PC, <laughs> and see that it okay. ran. If DOS runs, <laughs> okay. <laughs> DOS, uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You had These to have that. Programs. Yeah, absolutely. So you probably had a suite of things that you had to do and test and see. It. Oh, it seems to work. It's not crashing. Lotus 1, 2, 3 is displaying properly. Uh, okay, it works. That's exactly right. Yeah. Those were uh, the great times and uh, also very easy compared to the state <laughs> of the industry today. <laughs> yeah, it's gotten a little harder. Do you, have you yeah, seen Hanging too. Catch Fire? No, I haven't. You shouldn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just make you crazy because it's about that era, you know. But I, uh, but I think it's historically, it's a, it's a, it's a fictional piece. So, It'd probably make you nuts if you watched it. <laughs> uh, wow, we're, this is really, uh, uh, you know, I think what what I love about this show is, uh, yeah, you can interview, you know, the Bill Gates of the world, but it wasn't. There were so many people making such an important difference and and building this industry and so many of them are you know kind of underreported and i don't want to say unsung but they deserve more attention and mr shankar you're one of them i mean this was very important stuff um phoenix had done the same thing but they were they not doing a 286 motherboard well, they were doing a 286 motherboard, but we were the first with a 386 uh, design. Oh, they did it too. They did the AT. They did the AT. I see. So, and you said, well, so, we can do better. So what we did, we did this 386 motherboard design for Michael Dell. Yep. We also did the BIOS for him. And then we delivered the entire design package to Michael. Uh, what Michael did, he decided that... Um, he could not be the first in the industry with the 386 product. So believe it or not, after paying us for doing the design and, uh, and after having us develop the design, he decided to cancel the project. What? Yes. Was he going to wait for exactly Compaq? Is that was his plan? Well, what he did, he hired a consultant who advised Michael that he should not be the first. Yeah. For legal reasons or for market reasons? 
Uh, for market reasons, the consultant thought that 386 was going to have a lot of technical issues, uh. the things that uh, the consultant was concerned about. For example, he asked me in a meeting, Shankar, can you guarantee that DOS will run at 386? 16 megahertz clock speed. It's too damn fast. <laughs> it's too damn fast. <laughs> Michael was in the room and he looked at Michael and said, you know, these are pitfalls. You cannot be sure that DAWs will function at 16 <laughs> megahertz. Call, call Bill, find out. <laughs> <laughs> then he also said, Lotus 123, that's another important product. That's going to run at 16 megahertz. Better and ask all Mitch. these plug-in cards. <laughs> Oh yeah, that no, that may be legitimate. The hardware that plugs yeah. into it, yeah. Yeah. So the bus was running at 16. So we had a neat way of uh, overcoming that problem. So what we did, we were running the bus at eight megahertz. What so we divided the clock by right. two and ran it at eight, so that the bus which was running at eight megahertz could work. So what you also did for those programs that would not run at 16. We had a dual clock mode. So did you worked, invent uh, the turbo button? He, actually, we did, and we didn't patent it. <laughs> oh, man. Because we were the first. Yeah, <laughs> I wish we had it. <laughs> That's the turbo button, right? It's it, You you can choose. Yeah. You could choose 16 to 8, 8 to 16. Wow. We had a neat little circuit that could allow you to switch without uh, hanging the CPU. It worked. And it worked beautifully. Yeah. You should have so, patented that, yeah. So we told Michael, we have overcome all the problems, you take a chance, and he wouldn't. Yeah. Was he so also then, a little bit worried about getting uh, sued by IBM? I don't know if that was a reason. If that was, he didn't tell me that. Yeah. He told me that. Um, he just didn't want to be the, the, the guy getting the yeah. arrows in the back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That if the machine didn't work, he was concerned that his reputation may be jeopardized. Right. So for this reason, he decided that he didn't want to be the first to introduce the product. As it turned out, he was wrong, I think. Yeah, it, um, so what he did, he canceled the project. He wanted me to become a full-time employee of the company. I thought about it and decided that since I had just started the company, that was not for me. So I decided to leave PCs Limited and head to Atlanta, where I had worked years earlier, to continue my work. A so, smart decision. Yeah, I think so too. So yeah. what we did, we started doing a new 386 motherboard design. Then the following year, we went to Vegas and said that we had a 386 motherboard design that we could license to anyone who wanted it. So uh, we got several people interested in the product. So all we had was a sign which said 386 designs. Yeah. And we had people flocking to our I bet. Boot. I bet. Had Intel already produced the 386 or was it just some something coming? See, nowadays when Intel comes out with a new chip, there's everybody and their brother says, quick, I want it. I got to make a machine on it. Uh, it surprises me that th I presume the 386 was out or you wouldn't be able to make designs. Yeah, the CPU was uh, available and the motherboards came much later. Intel came out of the motherboard, but the difference that we made to the design that we did was to use the cache technology. So we, we are not only the first with the 386 motherboard, but you also use cache technology, which nobody else did at that time. It turned out that Compaq was the first to do it, came out of the 386 PC, but it was not using cache. It was using right. interlude memory. I so remember the, the Compact 386 as being the first, actually, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. After Compact came out of the product, then Michael got interested in a 386 design, so he came to AMI and wanted to find out if he could get 386 motherboards <laughs> from AMI. He'd already paid to develop them. <laughs> you know, well, that design had been canceled, so right. we started on a new design. Sorry. And using the new design. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. We are licensed to other companies, so what we used to do, buy the board back from these companies and resell them. Wow. 
So we became uh, a motherboard reseller because what we found is that there was not much money to be made by selling 386 motherboard designs. Even though we had many of them, we found that we were creating these companies that were very successful selling the designs, selling motherboards using our designs, but we were not making much money. So we decided to buy the motherboards back and resell them. Hmm. And since this was the only motherboard with cash, we had a lot of customers interested in the product. Tell me about that. So you were you were the guys that invented, is it L2 cash, L3 cash? We were the first. Yeah. I, I would not claim we were the first to do it because what we found was an application not from Intel. We talked about using L2 cash. So what we did, we used the design concepts from Intel and implemented it. But Intel itself did not use it. Interesting. So we were the first in the world with a 386 cache based model board. So the, but nowadays the L2 cache is in the processor. Yeah, exactly. It's in the die. But in then in those days it was not? No. And what did you use? You must have used very fast memory for the cache. We used SRAM. So we, uh, it was all implemented using discretes. So it had a lot of chips on the motherboard. Yeah. But it was about 20% faster than any other comparable product in the market. So in those days, PC Magazine used to run benchmarks and award editor's choice to the fastest motherboard. And we used to get editor's choice all the time. Oh, yeah. I do remember that. That You know, it's so interesting because... It seems short-sighted. I guess Michael just really didn't want a buggy. He didn't want to put out a buggy system. He'd seen companies do that and actually fail. You know, go out of business as a result of it. Uh, and Apple very came very close to doing that with uh, the uh, Apple III, and that was uh, probably in recent memory. So I guess he probably didn't want to be that guy. Yet at the same time, it's very clear customers, especially in this era, were really craving speed. They wanted more speed. There was no question about it. They wanted those Lotus 123 spreadsheets to recalculate faster. So you were you were right, obviously, in the long run. We're talking to S. Shankar. He's the founder and still runs a great company, American Megatrends. I, you know, I see those uh, those three mountains in my sleep as the machine boots up. AMI, BIOS, there they are. For years, every time you booted a PC, that's what I would see that's what you would see, and it's a, a real thrill to get to uh, talk to you, uh, Mr. Shankar. Thank you for joining us. We're going to take a little break, come back with more in just a bit. Of course, about that time, I think I got my first Epson printer, my MX-80. Remember that? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Epson's still in the business. They do great printers, and, of course, we've come a long way, baby. These new Epson printers with precision core technology do 40 million drops of ink a second. We're talking speeds up to 3 Seconds a page. So what is that? Uh, 20 pages a minute. 220 ppm. And they're beautiful, crisp text. And now with the EcoTank printers, Epson does it again. Two years of ink in the box. Take a look at Epson's new ET4550. Perfect example. It's a wireless all-in-one printer. Doesn't use ink cartridges. It, it has a refillable ink tank. And in the box, you get up to 8,500 8, color pages. 10,000 black and white pages. That's about 50 ink cartridge sets in the box. Two years of printing in the box. I keep saying in the box. It's amazing. 11,000 pages. That's amazing. And by the way, these are you're going to love these printers. Whichever Epson Workforce printer you choose, whichever EcoTank printer you choose, high speed, vivid colors, laser quality black text. It's so quiet. It's And there's no warm, unlike lasers, there's no warm up time. They've got a great 30-page document feeder that actually works. And it prints wirelessly from your smartphone, from your tablet. You can put the printer anywhere you want. I have mine kind of in a, a, a alcove under my desk. What an amazing invention. EcoTank, an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. And by the way, after two years, low-cost replacement ink bottles like that. Now you have the freedom to print without running out of ink. Epson.com slash EcoTank. Find out more. Transform the way your home, your office, or your work group prints. EPSON.com slash EcoTank. We thank them so much for their support. Epson, exceed your vision. I even had 
Epson made in the day a copy of the Model 100, you know, the the slate, and it had a little, it had a little Epson thermal printer in in the in the thing. Like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I, I wish I still had that. We're talking to S. Shankar. He is the founder of American Megatrends. A M I. It was Phoenix and A M I for a long time. Did you guys ever get sued by IBM? Uh, no, I. I was never sued by IBM. So they, I think they went after Phoenix, didn't they? Uh, I'm not sure if they did. I, I don't can't think remember. they did. Oh, okay. I, don't, I think they went after Eagle, for example. Eagle, I had an Eagle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, because the whole idea is, hey, how could you possibly duplicate our BIOS without looking at the source code? We published the source code. We know you looked at it. But I think you and Phoenix were so careful to document this process you described of having two teams, one that makes a spec based on the source code, and the other, which never sees the source code, writes the BIOS based on the spec. And it worked pretty well. It did. Um, we know that uh, IBM uh, took a look at uh, AMI BIOS, and uh, they didn't uh, come back to us and uh, say anything, so we assumed everything yeah. was all right. Yeah. In fact, IBM ended up being a licensee oh, you're for kidding. AMI BIOS. Oh, that, seriously! It went full full circle. Yes, because IBM came out with um, motherboards. For the motherboards that IBM did, they did license a BIOS, and they came to the AMI and took our BIOS. Wow, that's hysterical! You were the first to use onboard L2 cache <laughs> on a motherboard. For 386, yeah. On the 386, you also did the first 486 motherboards, I think, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now those that was a speed demon. Uh, you were the first to do a motherboard on the Quad Xeon, the Megaplex. So you have state. In fact, you still sell BIOSes. What happened? Didn't UEFI make this uh, change everything though? UEFI is uh, you can say is a BIOS, but uh, the standards are a bit different. UEFI is based on the driver model. Right. Extendable so firmware. Exactly, because if you really think about it, a PC needs a piece of firmware to boot the operating system. Every computer needs something to boot the operating system. It depends upon what the boot software or the firmware is capable of doing. UEFI is a standard that replaced the old IBM PC BIOS. Right. So every PC that you get today does use some kind of boot firmware. It could be the PC BIOS, which is a legacy BIOS, or today it uses the UEFI BIOS. So we supply UEFI and we call it Aptio. Aptio, okay. Right. The difference why you don't see the AMI name, the reason is that when you boot the screen many times, you don't see Aptio on the screen. Right. The customers that we have today hide Aptio. Yeah, they want you to see HP on the and Dell, and they don't want to see Aptio. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I hate that. I want to see. Not only do I want to see what BIOS, I want to see the whole startup sequence. <laughs> I want to see the whole thing. I want to see the power on self test and on. It's kind of. It's. Are you glad you got into this PC business? It's been uh, very exciting, actually. So yes, of course, I was. Very happy that I got into it, and I continue to be happy that I got into it. Let me ask you, because there's a lot of press these days about immigration reform and H-1B visas and all of that. Uh, you came into the country in the mid-'80s. Uh, what was the situation? Was it difficult for you to get in? Well, um, I had come to the United States in the 70s, and I'd gotten my green card at that time. Okay. But... That, um, for various personal reasons, I went back to India in 1980, and I was working for a computer company in India. But that company didn't do well and went bankrupt, and that is when I decided to come back to the USA. So I did have a green card when I came here. And for this reason, I did not have any problems with uh, my visa or work permit at right. that time. But it's, it's something to remember is that uh, you came to the United States, as so many generations have, and helped build this country and helped make a huge difference here. And I think it's something we forget often in the immigration debate is how important uh, 
people are who come to this country, want to be in this country, and end up making a huge difference. How many people do you employ? Worldwide, we have more than 1,300 employees. It's a big company. And you powered the PC industry for 30 years. <laughs> 30 years! Are you going to have a big party? Uh, yes. When's that? Every day is a party day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> I do want to talk about Andre because this is a little bit of a departure. But but a couple more things. You were, I think, the first to put Raid on the motherboard, right? Um, One of the first. I don't know if you were the first, but yeah, we we went from other boards to designing and developing Raid products, and that became a major hit. We practically sold Raid products to almost every server company in the world. Wow. For that reason, it became the number one RAID controller product. Uh, we sold that division off to LSI Logic in 2001. A lot of people, though, who uh, were exposed to RAID on PCs, that first RAID you used was almost certainly an AMI uh, product. Uh, you were the first to support USB in BIOS. That was a big deal. I think it was Windows, was it Windows 98? SE was the first to support uh, USB, I think so, in the in the operating system. But getting BIOS support made everything so much easier. Um, we, we worked closely with Intel to develop support for USB. At that time, we foresaw the, the appeal of USB. So we engaged with Intel early on and were able to work with a number of different customers and enabled a number of different USB peripheral products with the USB firmware. So these are all somewhat related to the BIOS work that we were doing, but kind of specialized. You, you expanded it. You were the first, I remember the first BIOS that I could actually go into the BIOS settings and use a, uh, a mouse and we had a GUI. <laughs> that was a big deal. Uh, that's right. Go, down, 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 left, 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 down, 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 back, 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 escape, escape, escape. Uh, you had uh, ACPI, you were the first to do ACPI in BIOS. I mean, a lot of firsts. Were there some products, though, that you guys got behind that ended up not going anywhere at all? Uh, yes, there were a number of different products that we worked on that uh, didn't uh, succeed all that well. Um, you know, it happens. We always try and work on new technologies. Not every technology that we work on succeeds. For example, we worked on VGA cards uh -huh. for a period of time. We worked on multimedia products. You know, that combine fax, modem, video, all in one product using DSPs. Uh, we called it MediaTel. That did not go anywhere. So there have been uh, some developments that we didn't succeed in because of various reasons. But there have been enough products that have been successes that have kept the company going. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, you figure there's always going to be a few bets you make that uh, aren't going to pay up. But as long as the... As long as enough of them do, uh, you're, you're golden. Um, such a, it's it's really uh, if it, I I'm not kidding when I say I have this fun as I remember these mountains, booting up. And it's it's just uh, so many great memories, uh, thanks to the AMI uh, BIOS. But things move on. AMI is still a, an engineering driven firm, right? I think almost all your employees are engineers. They're not you know this is about engineering, not marketing and uh, and sales. You. you you, you have to build products constantly. That's very true. Uh, we are an OEM company, and for this reason, we tend to develop technologies and offer it to OEMs. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, Android. I want to take a break, and we're going to talk about Android and why. And by the way, thank you, because you... <laughs> You finally made it possible for me to play Clash of Clans on my desktop. <laughs> but first, we're talking to S. Shankar, the founder of AMI, American Megatrends Incorporated, uh, a pioneer in the PC industry, and now 30 years later, doing some very interesting things with Android. But first, a word from our uh, sponsor, Blue Apron. I like to cook. I like to cook a lot, but I, you know, it's the, I don't cook as much as I want to. We end up eating out a lot because... I don't want to go shopping right after work, long work day. You got to go shopping, buy the ingredients, and then you got to cook. So it's always a pleasure. It's always a thrill when I get home. And there's my Blue Apron box, nice and fresh, refrigerated box on the front doorstep. In each box, three new meals that I can make myself. All the ingredients, just so, plus the recipe card. Blue Apron. It's like getting. It's like a Christmas gift right on my doorstep. 
every time I come home. It's less than $10 a meal, and you get everything you need. There's a Blue Apron box. You get everything you need and no more, so there's no waste. It's always fresh, and I really like this. All the produce comes from local farms, picked at the peak of perfection. The meats and the fish, always fresh, never frozen. Ooh, black beluga lentils. Ooh, That's the other thing you get is you get ingredients. They're very innovative at Blue Apron. You get ingredients you may have never tried before which I love, watermelon, radishes. We found a new bok choy I'd never tried before. Farro, purple potatoes. No matter what your dietary preferences, Blue Apron can customize your box so that you get exactly what you want. You can take a break if you're going to go on vacation. You're totally in control. The menus change every week. In fact, you can go right now to blueapron.com slash twit and take a look at this week's menu. Oh, I'm, my mouth waters every time I do this. Chili rubbed steaks with quick kimchi and tomato rice. I've never made anything with kimchi. That's going to be interesting. Smoke. Oh, I want this. This is this is comfort food. Smoky Gruyere filled uh, grilled cheese with fried eggs and butter lettuce salad. Look at that's the one in the middle there. <gasps> Crispy tofu drunken. Oh, 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 get out of here. Oh, I want that now. Look, here's the deal. Recipes between five and 700 calories a portion. They're always healthy. Lots of vegetables, lots well-made, delicious, and good for you. And you're going to learn to cook them so that you'll have the confidence next time when you see a shallot to say, I know what to do. I know what to do with that. Get your first two meals free right now. Try it. You got to try it. Just trust me. You got to try it. Look at That's the grilled cheese. Oh, that's awesome. Blueapron.com slash twit. Blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank them so much for their support of triangulation. It's just a better way to cook. They do this to me every time, making me hungry. S. Shankar is our guest, founder of AMI American Megatrends. Tell me how you got into the Android space. That's kind of different. Uh, well, uh, you know, we have been doing BIOS. And after we sold the Ray business off, we also started doing server management. We do see a couple of other products. One is server management and the other relates to network storage. What we do is to keep an eye on the industry, industry direction, industry trends, mm -hmm. and uh, try and develop new products for the industry. So when Android was created by Google, we foresaw that Google would make uh, Android extremely popular. So we created a team to start developing uh, products that were Android related. Interesting. So we thought initially we could develop some applications, but we are not really an app company. We are more of a firmware system software operating system company. So for this reason, we decided that one of the things that we could try and do was to offer Android porting services. And once we started working on it, we decided that um, we could try and do dual operating system. That is, in addition to Windows, also do Android. So our very first idea was to allow users to switch from Windows to Android. That is, have Android and Windows coexist. So like a dual boot system, kind of. Yeah, bare metal. And uh, switch between Windows and Android. While working on it, we came up with the idea that an easier way to do it would be to have Android hosted in a virtual machine separated from Windows, which would allow users to quickly switch between Windows and Android and give the users the experience of Android on an x86. That's how we came up with this Duos product idea. So we were kind of different from what others were trying to do at the time, in that we created a virtual machine. We tried not to make too many changes to the Android operating system itself. We got the open source Android, made some changes to the back end because we wanted to rely on Windows driver, which was available. Android driver, as you know, was often laid to the market. So this way we were able to introduce Android-based products as soon as Windows became available. That was the whole idea. And because we have an excellent relationship with the PC industry, we work with almost every PC company in the world. We wanted to take this Android product and offer it to our customers 
அதாவது ஒன்று பண்டுல் ஆண்ட்ராய்ட் ஏஎம்ஐ டூவல்ஸ் வித் தேர் பிசிஸ் so that our customers the idea was our customers would be able to offer a regular pc and with uh, a hot button key switch to android we had also added arm emulation so the idea was that we could allow them to run arm products on an x86 with the power of x86 because x86 is far more powerful and has a higher cpu clock than arm we figured that even with emulation arm apps would run fairly fast if not faster than native arm applications and our strategy kind of worked because when it came out of the product we had almost every oem interested in bundling the product with the pc and you know at the time intel was also introducing a concept by which you could get a notebook and convert it into a tablet you know dual format kind of a thing so in the tablet mode we thought we could have android and then when the product was used as a regular notebook run windows so two in one kind of a thing yeah. so there's a lot of interest in the market uh, we went around every oem that we talked to was interested in trying it out but there was a catch we found all the oems wanted the android to be certified by google <laughs> so we started working with um, our oems to get the product certified you know google has some tests that have to be completed right which uh, we were able to do oh interesting so we got oh. we got the product to a point where it met all the google tests we worked with google to meet every requirement that they had and we thought that we were uh, there that our OEMs would be able to ship the product. In fact, one of the OEMs made a big market splash by announcing our product on their notebook. I remember that. I won't, we won't mention the name. <laughs> And many, many trade publications carry... It's like a big deal, the, yeah. ...the announcement saying that, hey, two operating systems in one PC. So you could see that there was a lot of interest in the industry. Unfortunately, Google changed their minds about certifying Android and Windows on the same platform. Yeah, it was a threat. So they, they decided to withhold consent. So we hit the barrier at that time. Yeah. Our OEMs told us that they were interested in the product, but they did not want to upset or offend Google and wanted AMI to work with Google to get the product certified. And Google... when we tried to talk to google google said you have to work with the oems because we don't work with the amr oh interesting but, <laughs> but our customers said you had to get it certified yeah. because when we talk to google google says no we yeah. don't want you to do it yeah so we got we got caught in this clash of the titans between google and microsoft really a and, shame uh, because of course yeah, it yes. would be a wonderful thing to have but in the long run it doesn't really impact the user because i can do it myself so we had to change our strategy so what we ended up doing was to convert the product into an end user product yeah we now have it hosted in the cloud we have end users downloading the product installing it they can try it for free for 30 days and if they like it then they pay a small fee it's very and affordable have, yeah and they have a lifetime use for the product. So you you do the same uh, little jig that uh, people like uh, Cyanogen Mod end up uh, doing, companies that don't have the full uh, Google approval. You you offer a version of the you basically offer the open source, the AOSP version of Android. Uh you get your choice of Jelly Bean or Lollipop. Jelly Bean is 10 bucks. Lollipop is 15. and then you just download the google apps and services add them as you do with cyanogen mod and you have a full android just like on your that's, phone that's right it's kind of a loophole google allows i guess you know i have to say i am using i only buy touch windows machines now i mean because i, I love touch and so i have the surface book and i've been running uh, ami uh, duos on it uh, there and i just installed it on my uh, 13 inch dell little little memory lane for you <laughs> and it works great um uh, so it's a it's a virtual machine it's an it's emulation 
If the virtual machine, Android runs in the virtual machine, the emulation is for the ARM, native ARM applications. Because, uh, I mean, I guess with the open source, you could recompile it for x86, but then you, you can't recompile the apps. That's right. Yeah. So, so you, if there's a native app, if there's an x86 version, then there's no problem. Right. But if there's an ARM version of it that you download, then in order to run it, you need the emulation support. How hard was it to do the ARM to x86 uh, emulation? Um, it, it took some work mainly because of the performance-related uh, issues. Right. What we do, we change the back end we, because we try and use the Windows drivers. For this reason, the tuning took some time. And uh, there are always a few gotchas here and there which you have to work around. So I would not say it is the easiest thing in the world, but it is something that can be done. It requires a little bit of diligent work, which is what we did. Well, you're, you guys have the best, obviously, have the best engineers out there. It works really well. Uh, and it, it, did you find, do you find that performance is equivalent to a high-end, it seems to me to be equivalent to a high-end Android phone? Uh, we have some benchmarks which show that many of the applications run faster, faster. than they would on an ARM product. There could be some which may be a little bit slower. It's all over the map, but in general, they, they are faster. It certainly doesn't seem to be uh, in any way a disadvantage. And then do you run, you're running the Dalvik uh, uh, Java-ish VM on top of this, but you don't have to port that because that's all ready to go as long as you have ARM support. Yeah, we use whatever comes with the Android yeah. open source. Makes product. that very easy. Yeah, that's right. Now, of course, the issue is keeping it up to date. I notice you only have, the most recent you have is Lollipop. Um, is there a plan afoot to go to Marshmallow? Is that, how hard is that to do? What we do is uh, we will start working on it. So we don't want to have too many releases, lest it confuse customers. It's confusing, yeah. Yeah, so maybe next year we will come up with a Marshmallow. But you don't, as a user, as a customer, I'm sitting here with Lollipop, I'm not going to get any updates to Lollipop. Uh, we do uh, maintain it, so till oh, okay. we come up with marshmallows, so what we do is we will update it, and then when there's an update, you are free to download it and install it on the same machine. Oh, okay. So, uh, good. All right, so I'm getting some updates, uh, and then I'll also be getting a marshmallow upgrade at some point down the road. The marshmallow, uh, we are not yet uh, decided how we want to do it. It may be a different uh -huh. product. Okay. It all depends upon the time, energy, and effort required to develop it. I have uh, to say, when you have a touch screen running Android, I mean, in fact, I should show you this because it's pretty impressive. It's just, it's the same. There's the, at the bottom of the screen, you see the back button, you see the recents uh, button, the recents will pop up. This is all just, I've gone full screen. You don't have to run it in full screen. You can run it in a small screen. You can open the apps. Now, I, haven't, I just installed this, so I haven't yet installed the Google apps and the Google services, but that's just a download and it's an easy install. And, and the apps run, and they run uh, just as if you're running an Android device. Haven't put any pictures on here yet. Is there, are there some hardware limitations? I noticed, uh, does the camera work, things like that, the GPS? Uh, the, the camera does work. Uh, the, the main thing is the memory. Because at the end of the day, you have Windows also like, coexisting with Android. It is a VM, that. right. Yeah, exactly. So, so you there's a little... Go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. So you have a configurator, very much like anybody who's run a virtual machine like a VMware will recognize uh, the configurator that lets you choose how much memory is allocated to Android and how much is mem memory is allocated to Windows. Most modern Windows machines, you're going to have so much memory available that giving Android a, a gig or two of memory is not a hardship at all. What do you recommend, Mr. Shankar? We recommend at least a minimum of three okay. uh, gigabyte, if not four. So uh, at the low end, there could be a little bit of a challenge because it may run a little bit slower with just two gigabyte because Windows does require a lot of uh, memory. So that is the only disadvantage that you have seen with this approach when you have both Android and Windows coexisting on the same platform. You also allow people to say uh, which Windows folders hold music, video, pictures, etc., and share those folders to uh, Duos. So Duos can see your pictures, it can see your music, it can see your documents. 
Um, I, I think, that, okay, I'm going to give it a little bit more uh, memory here. So you say a minimum of two gigs. See, it's just a little slider like that. Um, you can even run in root mode, which I like. You have just a little checkbox that puts you in root mode. Nice job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You let to congratulate the engineering team who did it. That's sweet. You know, I don't have to root duos. It's root if I want, and I can have it rooted. Uh, just really, I, I think this is so uh, swift. Uh, what about compatibility? Have you found most Android apps run just fine? I would say the compatibility is greater than 90%. Uh, there are some, um, some what I would call ill-behaved programs that may cause some problem. But otherwise, it's uh, it's just uh, runs fine. Is there a category of programs that are more difficult to support? You uh, and often in emulation, you kind of provide it. You have to provide an interface between the emulator uh, and things like network cards and cameras and other hardware stuff. And it seems like the, all of that seems to work just perfectly. I'm on. I can get online. Um, the camera, as you said, the camera will work. Um, are there? Is there a category that is more difficult to implement? You know, GPS is one of the things that yeah. um, many times I can trip us because, as you know, in Windows, uh, that's not really supported in the in the notebooks that we get. Right. So, so any program that requires GPS or something would cause a yeah, problem. So these are some of the things that you have seen that uh, can cause some compatibility issues because they look for it, and if they don't find it, they don't run it. What's nice is it's a 30-day free trial, so you have plenty of time to, to put it on your system, uh, try it, play with it, see what you like. I immediately paid for it. I was so pleased. I just ran a couple of games because that's one of the, I, I suspect, one of the big reasons people would want this. Uh, I had tried BlueStacks and other uh, Android implementations, and in almost every case, uh, games were difficult. Not It was a very limited set of applications that would run. But as far as I can tell, this is very much... You know, I, I logged in, once I installed the Google services, logged into my Google account, downloaded all the apps. It, I'm running uh, the Nova launcher, my alternative launcher to the Google launcher. Everything seems to run great. It's like having an Android device on my Windows device. And I think there's a lot to be said for having access to uh, Android uh, while you're running Windows. Now, I'm running it full screen. You don't have to run it full screen. Um, so you can have an, even have a windowed version. Uh, of Android running uh, behind the scenes. It's a great way to keep uh, keep your clash of clans uh, on top of things. We're going to take a little break, come back with some final words with our guest, S. Shankar. He's the founder of AMI, a pioneer in the industry, a man who's transformed personal computing and now is bringing Android to your Windows machine. I'll be honest with you. It's a good reason to run Windows. <laughs> I, uh, I use Mac a lot, but when it comes to running Android, there's nothing like it. Our show today brought to you by Prosper.com, a great invention. The Internet's answer to, uh, you know, kind of a it's, not a, it's not a huge problem, but it's a little bit of an issue getting some cash when you need it. A quick loan. Uh, it's an alternative to the bank loan or borrowing money from family or friends. What most people do is they borrow against their credit cards and at the interest rate credit cards charge. That should be illegal. I mean, that is just a recipe for disaster. In fact, one of the first things you might do with a loan from Prosper is pay off all those high-rate credit cards. Get them off your back with a low fixed-rate loan from Prosper.com. So Prosper pretty much invented this category. They were one of the first in the world to do this. I think they were the first in the U.S. to do it. But they, it's, it's what they call peer-to-peer -peer lending. You can actually go as a, as a lender, as an investor, to Prosper.com and try it. And, uh, uh, and and I think a lot of people are very happy investors. But what we're we're going this ad is for the the the, the borrowers. You can, but they, that's the idea. It's a marketplace that brings lenders and borrowers together, um, and uh, you get a great interest rate. Of course, you know Prosper intermediates it, does all the you know does all the work. So as far as you're concerned, it's very simple. It's just very similar to just going online and borrowing money. If you go to Prosper.com/triangulation, you actually can fill out a simple form. Get your rate right now without affecting your good credit, and uh, it's like Uber or uh, Airbnb. It just it's just it's just friction free. Find out what your low rate is right now. Don't affect your good credit. Just find out what it is. Prosper.com/triangulation. You can borrow up to thirty five thousand dollars and get that money in as quickly as five days. So instead of getting stuck with a high interest rate credit card, 
Go to prosper.com. They invented it. Prosper.com. Peer-to-peer lending. It's a brilliant idea. As Shankar has been our guest for this hour. Uh, of just a fascinating story. Do you get to go back to India and visit? Do you have family back there? Yes, I do. I go back to India. In fact, we have an office in India. That's we nice. We have offices in many different countries, so yeah. I travel quite a bit. That's good. So here, but but Atlanta has become your home. Atlanta has been the corporate headquarters since 1986. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm sure a, a very valued uh, member of the Atlanta community because uh, it's it's really interesting to see a company for 30 years uh, continue to, to be a leader in this category. So many companies in that 30 years have come and gone. Compaq, <laughs> one of them. Uh, Dell almost for a moment, but I think Dell's back on track, which is nice. Um, do, do you have some? Do you have some? Favorites that you that you miss from the 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 good old days. You miss uh, do you miss anybody or any uh, any uh, hardware or if you just or you just stay with the present. Uh, well, um, you know, when I look back at the old days, one of the things that uh, we could do, the U.S. used to be at the center of the technology world. So I used to travel a lot to California and spend a lot of time in California. In fact, uh, visit uh, so many different customers over there. Now our customers are worldwide. We yep. have to go overseas. Yep. And U.S., I don't know if I would say has, I mean, it is a leader, but I don't know if I would call it the leader in every field in technology. Certainly not so, hardware anymore, right? Certainly not for manufacturing. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to uh, so many different uh, categories of products, for example, embedded uh, products. Right. We find a lot of activity in Europe. Interesting. When we talk about um, yeah, a lot of uh, server technologies, we find a lot of activity going on in China. Yep. So PC industry is virtually transplanted to Taiwan. We Isn't see that activities yeah. in smartphones related technologies. We see a lot of activity in Korea, software in India. So we had to go to a lot of different countries, and we have seen over a period of time that we had to be in all these places. So we have set up offices in so many different countries today. It is a global, uh, a global economy now. There's no doubt about that. And there's probably no uh, turning back on that. But I, I don't know about you. I, I think I suspect I have such nostalgia for those early days. It was so exciting, the early days of the PC. Uh, I was in Silicon Valley. I was working in San Jose. It was a very exciting time. Um, and, and everybody knew something was happening, but we didn't know where it was going or what was, what was going to happen, except for a few visionary people, uh, like you. And I'm so thrilled that you could join us, uh, this week on Triangulation. S. Shankar, thank you. And thank you for uh, Duos. Uh, I, I hope you can, is it doing well? Is there a market interest in it? I want to really promote it because I want to keep it around. I love this thing. Absolutely. Um, you can see it. It's hosted in the cloud. We have many downloads and it's worldwide. Oh, that's nice. We, so we have anybody anywhere in the world that be able to download it, install it, try it out. And they can do it in their language because it's Android. Very nice. So this is the biggest advantage that we have. Yeah. Well, I hope Google maybe sees the light and uh, finally realizes that getting Android on Windows devices is not such a bad idea. Microsoft, remember Microsoft was going to create this bridge to make Android apps port to Windows Phone and they seem to have, just in the last couple of weeks, either abandoned it or delayed it. Um, maybe you should go over there and help them. Get that Android yeah, bridge that's, working. Uh, that's, a, that's certainly a thought. We have uh, we do work with Microsoft. Microsoft is a licensee for our BIOS, believe oh, it or not. That's great. So because of that, we have a relationship with Microsoft, and we make um, some overtures to them and make contact with them. We'll see where it goes. When I boot my uh, Surface Book, am I booting uh, some code? From yeah, some pro some products of su some Surface products use uh, AMI. That's awesome. It would be it would be Aptio though, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Mr. Shankar, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really been a pleasure to talk to you. My pleasure. Yeah, and everybody should uh, at least try Duos. There's something fun having uh, Android available on your Windows machine. 
We do triangulation every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC. I love it if you watch live. I love the interaction we get from the chat room. But uh, if you can't, don't worry. On Demand is always available after the fact, audio and video. In fact, this is a show you should subscribe to because, you know, it's, 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 you never know what you're going to get. And it's always exciting and always expanding and always interesting. Just to find, uh, find it at our website, twit.tv slash TRI. You can subscribe there in a variety of products or go to your favorite podcatcher and, and just search for Triangulation. You'll find it. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye.